Welcome to my Bob Thurman podcast. I'm so grateful some good friends enabled me to present them to you. If you enjoy them and find them useful, please think of becoming a member of Tibet House US to help preserve Tibetan culture. Tibet House is the Dalai Lama's cultural center in America. All best wishes. Have a great day. This is episode 26, titled, Flowing Through the Knots. So as the chief of, so this is again our, our Naga mythology, as the chief of snakes supports the earth with all of the mountains and forests. Um, so all the tantras rest on the Kundalini, all the yoga tantras. Um, all the yogas of tantra, in many ways of yoga tantra, uh, rest on Kundalini. But it's not the vertebral column. No, the translation is so good. Bunch of bones. Yeah. No way. Lively bones. It's the energy. Actually, Kundalini means the swirling. Yeah, the kunda, the coil. It's a coil, yeah, swirling, coiling. And usually called Kundalini, not Kundalini. Hmm? What? Usually called Kundalini. Kundalini, right. Yes. Yeah, one of the important protectors in the Guru Samaja Mangala's name is Amrita Kundalini. The, the swirl of elixir, of you know, death, elixir. Amrita, you know, elixir. Oh, okay. Amrita Kundalini. Okay. Sukta Guru Prasadena Yada. Um, Jagarti Kundali Tada Sarvani Padmani Idyante Grantayo Apicha. So this is when the Supta, when Supta, uh, it's awakened, Kundali is awakened by the Guru Prasad, or the, the grace or kindness of the Guru. Uh, and then all of the padmas, or all the lotuses, are, are all the knots in the lotuses are pierced. Um, and so, right. this is probably very important. Um, of course it is. Um, <laughs> so, rather than this being kind of a mechanical process in which you, uh, you know, out of having a very secure ego, you really practice and practice your mudras and bandhas every day, mm -hmm. and you huff and you puff and you body build, and uh, then you uh, try to master kundalini. Mm -hmm. um, usually you end up uh, going insane by doing that. Yeah. Um, and so it, the actual thing that... Uh, is the movement of Kundalini is what would we say prasad or Guru's grace. Guru's grace or kindness and so it's really a matter of devotion um, mm -hmm. and I like to say if, if Kundali, Kundali is a goddess mm -hmm. and uh, she's quite shy and uh, she doesn't like to be bossed around particularly by uh, just an ego structure uh -huh. um, and so, all you can do is send her an invitation and mm -hmm. uh, then arrange certain circuitry, you know. Mm -hmm. It's just like... Well, I said loosen circuitry. Yeah, loosen, yeah. unravel. You know, you make a few connections, you plug into public service, mm -hmm. unless you're, you know, off the grid. From, from and you've got to use solar or something. <laughs> but, but then and you do the wiring, you know, hopefully, you, sometimes you've got to get, you know, the wiring has to be correct so that... But until you plug in the whole system, it's quite useless. Yeah. And so there's an obsession with like piping and wiring, and uh, but piping is useless unless you hook it up to the water right. main. Although the Buddhist thing, the Buddhist thing, I mean, is, I don't know if this, this, I don't think that's a point of disagreement, but the Buddhist thing says that those lotuses, at each place, the five of them, right up to seven, I mean, they're a different system, but the what five. There's a knot around the central channel of the two right and left channels are knotted once at the genital, navel, throat, and brain, and three times at the heart, therefore six times at the heart chakra. And the, you have to loosen those knots 
But, and that that's where your your bundles and all of your grand unravelings and loosenings can work. Because otherwise, if you try to press pressure, or even if Kundalini, if a guru sort of invited Kundalini and that tremendous energy of Kundalini would go, they say that where you go insane is that that energy would come and because it would be blocked by the knot, it would go into the knot, the chakra knot, and make a bubble, like a kind of bubble trap there or something like that. And then you get nuts. You get that, That's what that is, and then yeah. you become insane. Yeah. So you can loosen is what you can do, right? So you can get flow through the knots. And what are the knots are, are really, um, they're samskara, and they're an overlay of um, basically uh, things that don't have to be stuck together. Mm -hmm. The basic idea of a samskara is you have a sensation pattern or a pattern in the prana, and then it's overlaid with memory and mm -hmm. ideas, mm -hmm. And those memories and ideas trigger story patterns. And in terms of especially the heart knots, mm -hmm. these have to do with lust, anger, greed, uh, vanity, selfishness, mm -hmm. uh, you know, all of those, the six enemies that surround mm -hmm. And all of these are relationships. And so they're huge history mm -hmm. around each knot. And so if you energize the knot, basically mm -hmm. with this vibrance um, or some people like they like to scare people away it's like lava you know hot lava <laughs> what? Just, where is the hot lava oh people say it's like pouring lava into a styrofoam cup oh too. and I don't know but anyway when you and it's just like you start hitting the, the samskar you hit the knot and mm -hmm. the knot is probably reflected myofascially you know it's in the it's in how you move, it's in how you posture the body, it's in mm -hmm. how you proceed, because there are areas of the breath, areas of the body that you can't really feel because they remind you of something that you don't mm -hmm. want to be reminded of. And then to start waking up the energy through the application of these, it hits the samskaras, these big knots, and it aggravates the situation. Mm -hmm to the point of you, you'll go crazy in your particular unique way that you're already crazy. <laughs> It'll just make you more crazy. Can, can I want to ask another question. Yeah. In the case of the, uh, in the case of the Buddhist view of this, yeah. in order to open the knots enough to be able to have energy in the central channel, you know, either Kundali coming from above or they, they may not only exclusively identify it with that, but that's a very important one. Um, they, you have to understand selflessness. Without understanding selflessness, in other words, the knot also is associated with the ego, the absolutization or the rigidification of the ego mm -hmm. uh, positioning, the ego pose, let's call it. And so that has to be relaxed through, and which can only be done by understanding that it is, it is hollow in the center, like yeah. a... It's a, it's a rope wrapped around itself that has no core. It seems to be, have a core inside, but it doesn't. It's like a slip knot. Right? So now, although yeah. the language in... So therefore, if that is so, then Tantra Yoga, this is my question, Tantra Yoga could not become prevalent in Vedist India as well as Buddhist unless Vedanta had already occurred, yes. yeah. where by Vedanta they... But we're into saying that Parama Atma was none of this ordinary Atma. Yeah. Is that fair? Yeah. So in a way, it's an Atma. It's There's an interesting same. definition of uh, Ahamkara. Yes. Uh, it's called the Chit Achit Granti. Okay. So it's a knot in which uh, that which is pure luminous consciousness or awareness right. is tied up with that which is not Chit or that which is okay, appears yes. to have a separateness okay. or self, and that forms a knot. Yes. And that's basically oh. ego function. That's the self-other yeah. uh, division over intensifying. Mm -hmm. right. and so, but that's really key. If that's, that's totally key, yeah. because if mm -hmm. you look at the Vedic practices, um, you, you'll say in the Vedic hymns a lot of you know trippy stuff, mm -hmm. to use the term. Um, but they were taking drugs, you know. These sure. Soma. And Soma. So, but it wasn't until the time of the early Upanishads and the Vedanta 
that philosophically they were specifically pointing out the, the selfless nature mm -hmm. of the self or the mm -hmm. selfless nature mm -hmm. of reality. And this is when the Vedic tradition was merging with those traditions that surrounded the Vedic culture. Right. You know, the other guys. The Shramanas. Yeah. The Shramana tradition. Yeah. And the vacationers. Yeah, the vacationers, the Agamas, the, those people who were steeped in practice but weren't necessarily Brahmins. Or, right. And uh, this is how yoga evolved. And yoga is... Mm -hmm. And, you know, the early... So the first book to be called a tantra is the... Uh, Sankhya Karika. Mm -hmm. The what? Sankhya. Sankhya Karika calls yeah, itself the Tantra? Just tantra. Really? Uh -huh. I and, didn't know that. And what it points out, what that particular book is emphasizes at the end, and people don't read to the end, they get bogged uh -huh. down, can't stand it, <laughs> toss it before they, is that Purusha is not actually a thing, but Purusha is selflessness. Oh, good. And just pure awareness. Uh -huh. So ultimately the nature of Prakriti is selflessness. Right. And so that system would then allow for the deep practices mm -hmm. of yoga, which um, in which your socks get knocked off, basically. Mm -hmm. uh, and but the, so there'll be no fear mm -hmm. because there's no dualism. Um, and so one of the ways but that Sankhya Karika still promotes a strong dualism, like yoga sutra. Not if you study it deeply. Really. In other words, it's a it's a. Okay. Yeah. This is my. Uh, Okay. Thesis. Okay. All right. <laughs> but it, most people read it as dualistic because they're lazy. And they're right. Right. <laughs> but, but even, but but in a way, you see, even Buddhism is allowing dualism at the time. Yeah. Because dualism, the very self-centered person, if you tell the very self-centered person that you know you can just merge with all of this, you're one with it all. You're one with your wife. You're one with the lower caste people. You're one with these, therefore you you can wash the dishes yourself. And if you tell them that 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 they can that if they enjoy that they can be liberated while washing the dishes, they're not going to go for that. No, they don't want a demotion. <laughs> no. So so therefore, if you let them think, oh, you can have a nirvana and you'll never have to see the kitchen, <laughs> then they'll make a big effort to get there. And when they get there, then they find out there's no self to grab it, and then they'll be ready to work. Then they'll be ready. Yeah. So so I'm you know so maybe the Sankhya people, Kapila and company. Or, you know, the great yeah, Kapila. Yeah, right, but they were non-dualists. But yeah, but maybe most secretly. followers, you know, yeah, okay. they get so lost. So that way I can incorporate that. Yeah, so these early systems use metaphor, and of course yeah. people don't... Yeah, well, Buddha did, I mean, yeah, his, his Nirvana, the Hinayana Nirvana is like He's dualistic. Metaphor. Yeah. Sure, same time, 500 BCE. And even he said, because he was a sociologist, he said, I don't want this non-dualism widely spread. About 400 years from now, that Nagarjuna guy will show up. And he will he will to spread my non dualist thing. But for about four centuries these people need dualism. These yeah. Indian people. To get a basis. Yeah. Now an interesting thing when the knots one of the methods of dealing with the knots right. um, is to practice uh, a kind of mindfulness with them yeah. in which you mm -hmm. observe the knot mm -hmm. as Vishnu. Oh, so you, you, you concentrate on your heart, and if you really see what's there, is some. initially there's this coating of yucky feelings and memories and yes. some grudges and some yeah. fears and some frustration. Oh, hala. And just like hala hala, that is Vishnu. The knot itself is Vishnu. Oh, that's definitely non -dualist. Yeah, then this whole mistake of I'm going to pierce it and get rid of it. Right. Uh, which doesn't work because it tightens when you try to pierce it. Of course. It just gets tighter and tighter and more frustrating. Then you start to see through it. Right. And you see that there's no need to pierce it. And it's pierced when, as you see, there's no need to pierce it, it's pierced. Right. Um, it's, you know, that. So they, they, call, they named them, you know, after. The, the heart knot, which is sixfold, yeah. is, is, um, is uh, the double triangle, you know, the Shiva Shakti triangle. The six points of the double triangle is, is there. And so you can see that as, as the bliss void indivisible, the non itself. But, and then actually, the female Buddha unravels it herself. You can't really unravel it. Yeah. 
you, you have to give it up and they, and uh, yeah. that can be unraveled. Yeah, devotion. So, same thing. You I like offer it. it. You you offer the lotus of your heart, which is yeah. slightly rotten, to the yeah. beloved. But yeah. you you're being honest at least. Is this like in Ishwara Pranidana? Okay. You you prostrate. Probably yeah. deny, you know, implying prostration. Yes. And this is metaphor. The top of your head opens because you clunk it a little hard. <laughs> and then your brain unravels on the ground in front of the deity who is pure consciousness. Excellent. And so the brain has thousands and thousands of folds or superimpositions. Mm-hmm. And they're all unrolled and exposed to the light of pure consciousness. It's quite embarrassing. And then every everything that is perceived is being perceived by the beloved, by the Paramatman, uh-huh. as it's being perceived. Uh-huh. So it's never look, it's it's looked upon basically uh, enveloped in compassion, mm-hmm. and, and and is then seen without self. Mm-hmm. And this is the only way to deal with. This is like the, the fundamental technique mm-hmm. um, that makes all of this work. Mm-hmm. Um, now the guru, is, uh, uh, another question about the guru prasadana. Guru the guru, um, this you know is, is absolutely essential, you know, in in tantric Buddhism, of course. Guru's role, guru's grace, and um, but and therefore it becomes the source of abuse and over dependency and a lot of problems outside of the initiatory work. You know what I mean? And it's it's exploited by both guru and and authoritarian personality bearing disciple uh, in their own way. But what the guru becomes the channel of the timeless traditions hologram fitting over your own imperfect structure when you're ready to surrender your structure. Is that fair? That's fair. That's fair. So the so the guru is in a way just a vessel. Totally a vessel. Right? And perhaps not a perfect vessel. Well, good, yes. But a lovable and, you know, evolved enough so that there's, right. like, you know, like most most of our people here would be nice gurus, I mean. <laughs> and they would say, oh, no, 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 not me, I'm not qualified. And that's your qualification, then, the fact that you won't right. touch it with a 10-foot the Tibetans, the Tibetans <laughs> have a saying. They say, the best guru lives at least three valleys away. <laughs> in other words, you get initiated, and then they're, then they're not around bugging you and bossing you around and doing different things, you know. Yeah. And that's a big distance, three valleys away. It's like beyond Boulder, oh, beyond in California. Yeah. Yeah. It's a long way away in Tibet. You're going to see him maybe twice in your lifetime. Maybe. Yeah, you get okay. five minutes of instruction. Well, totally. Yeah. Hopefully, I mean, if you're lucky, more, but, you know. Yeah, 10 minutes. Yeah. So, okay, that's good. So, so that's a total agreement. There's this thing, there's this prayer in the, in the Lama Chapa, the Guru Puja, written by the Pension Lama, which ends with, like, please come and put your toe in the center of my heart chakra, you know. And uh, that's, you know, there's, that's because that's, that's, that's how it happens. That's how it works. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. So, so those who get you know mad because there are scandals in these dharma centers and and yoga centers shouldn't throw out the baby with the bathwater of the you know the, the guru who goes overboard or goes out of bounds. The whole guru relationship remains absolutely critical, and therefore the institution has to be the Sri Padami Joyce. I mean, you may fa- it may fail to be that, but then, then it'll kind of go another way, unfortunately. Yeah. If you really have to fight for that, I think. Right. Sonia might be an ally in that. Yeah. I, agree. You know, I think. I agree. Right? Right? I do agree. That's a, the failure of many uh, yoga attempts at yoga centers or schools. Uh-huh. Uh, and I've taught at some of them, is the premise that Yoga is a viable business. The yoga is what? The, the yoga is a, is a business. It's a viable oh, right. business. Oh, and yeah. therefore that you can rent a space, put in some really nice furnishings, uh-huh. uh, you know, and gussy the place up. 
and uh -huh. then go and try to find some teachers to teach. That that's actually that this is a, a mistaken notion, and that's usually how people set up yoga centers. Um, and uh, with the boutique is there already, of course. But the boutique? The boutique has to be in place, and so many people want to do this, um, uh, and it, I just have seen it not work so many times. But the alternative that people often make a mistake is, you know, then the whole cult, uh, cult activity too. Yeah. But, the, but that's what, like you said, throwing the baby out with the bathwater. It's either, you know, there's got to be somewhere in between, you know, Jim Jones right. and, uh, and, and, uh, and the Upper West Side Boutique. That's right. And, and there is. So, yes, I think you're right. It needs to be anchored in Lineage, just like uh, just like they do in uh, Colombia. Okay, yeah, we'll do it. <laughs> Are you trying to do your go move off? I was trying to do something. I need the towel. With it. <laughs> okay, yes, but you know they shouldn't blame the yoga centers because that's the same problem with the universities. Well, right. They go and build a bunch of brick campuses, and they go and they charge tuition, and then they go and try to find some idiot professors, and then they come in and pretend to know something, and then they go in and brainwash people. Right. <laughs> go to Wall Street and conquer the universe. <laughs> but I wanted to say and something. We produce all these students who are graduate and have no ethics and they no knowledge of life and then they have bad marital relationships and then they're like, I've got a lot to look forward to. <laughs> but I wanted to, I, I wanted to think, uh, respond to something uh, just that you mentioned, Richard, about the uh, the very ancient, the context of the uh, the, the Vedic hymn. Um, and ritual context, like you say, it's quite clear that they were taking drugs and of some kind. And uh, medicine. It's a medicine. There was a medicine. <laughs> so much. Miracle. Huh? And uh, but the, whether or not that that's something that was phased out, or you know, that clearly by the time you know that the the, the ritual was was going strong at the time of Mahabharata, it's not really so clear that there was. Yeah. Real soma being the, the same kind of whatever hallucinogenic soma, yeah. but there were you know were substitutes. But the basic notion is that one is setting up a ritual context where you become possessed, where you become in, you your normal sense of self becomes completely uh -huh. taken over. You are Indra. You become God. And you have that special subjectivity of being God temporarily, which is just fantastic. So the the, the entire uh, groundwork for these traditions, even when they go in a very conservative direction, and wanting to sort of carve out like, you no, know, it's this God, not that one, or this is our special, uh, you know, my God is, is certainly better than yours. It, it's you, there seems to be almost no way to get away. I mean, even it's taken. It took India four or five thousand years to finally come up with fundamentalism at the, you know, modern neo Hindu, you know, Hindutva is a very very modern phenomenon. The fact that it didn't come up for so long is quite. Well, incredible. I don't agree. I think some sociologists in Chicago say that people have been fundamentalists forever. You know, fundamentalism is just a projection of the, f the initial fundamentalism, which is, I'm so great. That's right. the initial fundamentalism, is I'm, I'm absolute, but and you're not. And, uh, and that's the source of all human suffering, right? So then project it into my institution, my religion, my tribe, my whatever, my family, my clan, the Hatfields and the McCoys. I, I don't, the sociologists say, they say that because they're saying that fund modern fundamentalism uses all the you know internet and stuff, so therefore it's modern. Okay. But fundamentalism was always there. My, the, the, the thing that I wanted to just comment on is this idea of the culmination of the ritual process being the loss of self. Yeah. Which okay. is so... Uh, or transposition of it. The you know, transposition I mean, the medicine itself, yeah. that Richard is talking about, I think, about the Amanita Muscaria, which is what Soma most likely it was, which is a very amphetamine tile style related psychedelic or entheogenic, as Houston Smith calls them more nicely, uh, which is widely used all throughout Central Asia and so forth by as a vision quest substance. Uh, that 
that certainly creates, a, for those in Division Quest, a shattering of the normal world picture and identity structure, and therefore has to be held within a collective thing by a senior shaman or the person who goes nuts. You know, that's a typical, that, that, that's, the Vedas do grow out of that, I think everyone agrees. But the Indians are upset about it because uh, some of the Indian scholars did, the Indian Sanskritists, because they, these did grow in Central Asia. These mushrooms that yeah, they didn't in, really grow in not India. Not south in India. Yeah. No, and so then some people said, "Well, it's, it's, it's Bang, it's <laughs> Ganja." They do, I bet they do. <laughs> but but uh, and they say it's Bang, Ganja, and then or they, they were just using it placebo. They sort of say later in the ritual, and they lost track of it, and then made them very annoyed. They thought that was offensive. And uh, then more recently, there's been this big movement in India, sort of nationalistic saying that the Vedas didn't come from Central Asia and no, we made them up. And, yeah. so, I mean, that's all ridiculous because they definitely did, you know. Yeah. And, uh, uh, but they're stuck on that, you know. It's, that's like a British invention, you know, and a German invention that... The, yeah, that, that, that there are other countries is a British right. invention. Right, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other countries conquered India and yeah. then some outsider conquered and the Vedas were actually an imposition by outsiders. From the Harappan, you know, dark-skinned Indian people who are more agriculturalists, and these nomads came down with their chariots and, and horses, the yeah. and horses, yeah. So they, they, that that was an earlier pattern. Like the Mongolians, they get upset about that, and instead they're in the they, they're in the position of arguing that you know, we were we were the taxi wallets in Moscow and Babylon and, and in Alexandria even three thousand BC. We were already driving taxis over there. Yeah, we were spreading. Sand. Yeah, we were spreading sand and the natives over there. But that's silly. Oh, no, it's a joke. So, 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 yeah, but one thing I just want to say. In the Tantra, it's not just becoming God. Because, you know, in the Vedas, in the Vedic ritual, they never had icons of Indra or Marut or uh, Mitra or any of them. They never had an image. In fact, at Agni, they spread a kushagras thing for them to come and sit. So when they would get really stoned, then Indra would come, then they would give Indra Soma, not to be jealous of them, and so they would be close with the god. But the, the tantric thing of becoming Buddha, not just god, but Buddha, and, and adopting temporarily perhaps a divine form for whatever divine form, but still not as a god, but as Buddha. And, and it's not just Rudra of the Vedas. Rudra has become Shiva. You know, instead or Bhairava of the Vedas, Bhairava has become Shiva. Shiva means peaceful, auspicious. And why is he peaceful and auspicious? Because Uma insists upon it. And that's a that's a, that is the later Tantra thing. That's where the goddess Kundali and this uh, are coming out and being to assert over that sort of more wild Indian tribal thing. So so the God thing, you know, that's why they say Buddha is Deva Manushyanam Shasta, teacher of humans and gods. And so out of that Vedic ritual, which was not at the, that level, because they were scared of that God. Indra was scary. They would give him Soma because Indra, when he could, would take Soma, he would say, well, what shall I conquer now? I don't even know where I am. I, I mean, I'm, I don't know. I'm bigger than the universe. I have nothing more to conquer. I can take a break. And they'd say, yes, have more Soma. <laughs> and then they'd go back. Seriously. Yeah. They were scared. The Vedic gods were scary. And later, Shiva has become tame and a householder, you know, and it's like a yogi, but even as a yogi, he's like more tame. So Uma, like completely, how yogi is he, you know? She does. Remember Kumar Sambhava? Mm -hmm. Yeah, she controls you him. You know, you all know Kumar Sambhava, where Uma tames Shiva? You don't know that story? Does everybody know that story? No, tell us. Can you tell us? Oh, I don't, maybe I shouldn't distract and tell us. No, no. You should definitely tell the story what? of Buddha's former life as Indra. What? Buddha's former life as Indra, the Jataka. Oh, well, that's a really great story. Oh, really? You, know, you, you want, want to hear that story? I do. Well, there is, a, there is a story, a Jataka story of the Buddha where he was Indra in a previous life. Chakra, they called the Buddha's, but saying Indra. And he was conducting a war with the Asuras, which they usually do from the heaven of Indra, right? Olympus type, uh, Sudarshana heaven. And so, and temporarily, the Asuras had the advantage, and they beat up the gods, and they were retreating to regroup, you know, and go back and fight them back, right? And so Indra was, uh, was uh, galloping in his chariot along in a narrow uh, road in the forest. 
um, to go back and get some new troops and then come back and push the Asuras back to where they belong, right? But then he noted, Indra did, that the chariot pole was about to knock down an eagle's nest where they had fledgling little eaglets in it. He could see that. So he told the charioteers, stop the chariot. I can't knock down the eaglets, even though we're in war here. You know? And the charioteers said, well, look, they're running after you, all those outsiders, you're going to get keep wasted. You can't get back to your troops. If you really say, I don't care. The rules of war, they're my enemy, but not those eaglets. I can't knock them down. So then they he insisted on turning. So, okay, what the heck, I'll go back after. Never mind, I'll charge them. So then he turns the chariot, he charges at a vast line of asuras. And then the asuras think that his troops must be behind him or he wouldn't be charging, so they all run away. <laughs> so it's such a beautiful thing from, you know, that, that it's yeah. like changing even the rule of war, you know. Yeah. No collateral damage. It's the ultimate no collateral damage, um, you know, like Jataka tail, you know. Of, of when Buddha was Indra. When he was just an Indra then, he was killing and he was fighting and yeah. he wasn't Buddha yet. So there's this transformation of the, the understanding of the gods. That's a change of from, story. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and then when you, so when you identify uh, in the tantras with a particular god, these gods are not the, the ancient gods who have big egos and that's right, and are frightening. Yeah, and who these are, are loving gods. Loved. Yeah, and these are loving gods right. who are made of compassion itself. Yes. And who don't even, and who are constantly getting off the sense that they have a role or a, as God in order to be all other beings. So those gods, as you become those gods, you find these more evolved, like Vishnu or. Or Buddha. Yeah. Um, or Shiva when he's once he's Shiva. Shiva and no longer much. These smile. gods are busy identifying with all beings. Mm -hmm. You know, who yep. they they adore. They right. are selfless gods. Right. And so when you identify them with them, it's not like you become puffed up and you think, I am the Lord of the universe. Right. I'm gonna go conquer. Right. You start then you think, Oh, all other beings are me and they're all in my heart when you identify uh, ritualistically. Right. Uh, with these gods, and so it's a, it's a good, it's not a um, form of uh, megalomania, megalomania in the, the old sense of the word, and so therefore uh, you're able to get off of it too. In other words, yeah. it's, it's like a ritual identification, and you're very easily like that. You can stand up and you know answer the phone if it rings. Exactly, or, but it's too dangerous. Right? That's my point: is that it's too dangerous. These deeper things without either Parama Atma defined as not your ordinary ego self, yeah. or Shunyata, Anatma, Nairatmya, or the, the Buddhists have an expression, Nairatmya Parama Atma, the supreme self of selflessness, Nairatmya Parama Atma. And so that's what makes it safe, because in that case, you'll never be stuck in megalomania. You won't get it. Jung was so scared of Indian yogic traditions because he said it would lead to inflation, remember, Carl Jung? Yeah. But that's because he was Swiss. Yeah, and it's probably true. If he did it, he would have been really... <laughs> so that's really neat. Thank you. Yeah, so um, then I, yeah. I, I, I once uh, spent a, a day with Trungu Rinpoche. You know, Who? who? Trungu. Oh, Trungu Rinpoche, yes. He's very nice. Lama. Yeah, and he... Uh, it, it's a, that's a long story, but... He was going around doing different teachings around sure. Colorado, and I was just in the van with him. Right. And, oh, uh, really? It was just luck or something. You know, there was right. a van with him, and he would go around and he was doing uh, teachings on Vajrayana to these uh -huh. uh, retreatants, mm -hmm. and basically he's just saying the same thing that the the uh, Vajrayana of the secret mantra, you know, the uh -huh. uh, is taught once you have realized emptiness or shunyata. So once you're grounded in Mahayana, uh -huh. then the Tantra really works. Yes. And it's really what makes the Tantra work. Yeah. And if you don't have that initial grounding or context, then it's just some pretty dangerous, crazy technique. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. um, and so, so in parallel, I'm trying to say that 
the, the yoga sutras have, have the virtues, of certain virtues, and as you say, if you go back from Vedanta to the yoga sutras or Sankhya Karika, you can find in there non-duality at the deepest level. Yeah. But if you don't, if you just go to the yoga sutra without knowing Straight the on. non-duality, You'll you won't discover interpret it dualistic. so easily. Yeah. So, so you have to, you, you, it's the same way, you're safe in the inner yoga then, if you if you dealt with the the Advaita, yeah. that's all. if that's if that's fair, I mean, that, that's what I was inquiring about, yeah. and I think it, yeah. and that's really neat. That's my whole game, my whole like thing is to, is to refit back together, you know. And actually, then therefore, from Buddha's time to the conquest by the Muslims of India, is India's great ascent as a society and a civilization because it becomes more and more gentle. And the peacefulness that Aurobindo decried and accused the Buddhists and the Jains and then later Hindu, yo- Hindu celibate yogis and things of not being warriors and therefore letting themselves be conquered by Muslims and then by Europeans is actually, because he's seeing it from a European point of view of being conquered in international war, it's actually India's glory and to be praised that they were willing to choose a great life and be vulnerable as a society and have great ragas and have like more free women and have less rigid caste system and have non-duality and have 2,500 varieties of mangoes to slobber on and to be cool. And of course then some guy comes in dragging his wife behind his camel or his three wives, and, and he's like freaked out and he feels a, a gasoline vibe here in India and he wants to eat them and to consume it and he's going to beat them up. And then later, you know, they're going to make Taj Mahal to his wife and keep his camel outside. And the Brits come in all like all strapped up, you know, <laughs> marching with their stupid hats, looking all fuzzy, you know, like wearing like wool underwear. Wool underwear. Wool underwear and scratchy stuff and sweating and getting rashes and things. And then later, you got like George Harrison and the Beatles going, well, yeah, yeah, Roshi, Swami, whatever, you know. Guruji. Finally, the Brits get absorbed, you know, by this peacefulness, right? So that, so we don't have a decline. It isn't a decline and fall when you become gentle. It's an ascent. It's civilization. And then the Brits, and the Indi, and then the Indies, however, diabolically left that division with Pakistan and them, and then selling weapons to both sides, industrialized weapons to both sides. So, so then the, the Indians still can't discover the greatness of their society, which Gandhi was trying to push there, the Ahimsa, and you know, even everyone to be non-aligned. He was still a little bit cheap, but he couldn't really because he needed weapons because the mad loony Pakistanis were there, you know. And the, all the Pakistan generals were trained in Sandhurst, you know, all of them, Yahya Khan, they were all from Sandhurst. And the, and the European industrial weapons manufacturers were selling weapons to them, and then Indians had to buy some weapons. So they couldn't do their, you know, their Raga life, you know. Which is nice, huh? Right. Raga life. Okay. okay, that's all I wanted to. I'm giving John material for his thesis. <laughs> and for his institute. No, you have to defend India there. The, the, the University of Virginia, like, building some weird columns, you know, <laughs> and like some Plato. Yeah, and, like, columns. I don't know, Jefferson was himself the reincarnation of some yogi. Oh, he was right. Definitely. Poor guy. The John keeps coming up with the latest he was. discovery. John you know, when, when Dalai Lama, my archivist. When Dalai Lama visited Monticello, he said later, I don't know, there's something wrong with Tibetan history. I'm the reincarnation of that guy. <laughs> you know, I'm, he's not some kind of, I'm his reincarnation. <laughs> well, he said that? Yeah, he did. Wow. He said that. That's he it. said, I really like that guy. See, I'm him. He said. Mm. Somehow Jefferson had a little bit side like that. You know? <laughs> anyway. So therefore, the, if that's so, then the Tibetans, who were a huge empire, right, conquered China even at one time, and then they became vulnerable and they just got wasted in the last century. And then the Mongolians had the biggest empire in history, bigger than India, and then they became, but they're all coming out of this, yeah. out of Kundali. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And Kublai Khan. 
And Kumbha Khan? Kubla Khan. Kumbha Khan. Kumbha Khan. Khan. Yeah, Kumbha Khan. Khan. Kumbha yeah. Khan. Yeah. Started with the second. Became a student of the Dharma. Yeah, yeah, he did. Yeah. He did. And then, okay. and then later, the Altan Khan became a uh, third Dalai Lama, student of third Dalai Lama. One, so they, you know, but that's transmission from India. That's a transmission from Nalanda University that comes from Chandrakirti. How are you going to stop a bunch of people like that who are so tough, you know? They really were tough, you know? And how are you going to get to them except that they, I was talking to, to uh, about the purpose of life, you know, you have to show that there is a purpose uh, because, you know, of life to be really happy and have real bliss, which is way better than conquering people and grabbing their stuff. You know, that's a, that can be a little bit fun for a while, and like, you know, looting and pillaging. It's still exciting. <laughs> <laughs> it's like drag racing or something and banging people over the head. But it's much more fun to have your chakra your heart chakra explode with a kundali organ orgasm, I think. <laughs> I heard that. I heard that too. I'm still looking for it, but I've heard it. I think it's much more fun. And so those yogis had to get that, make that point to the Tibetans and the Mongolians to get them to drop their weapons and drop their 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 sacrificial victim business, you know, which they did. So that's what I'm. That, that's 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 what we're talking about here in America, which is the latest bunch of Genghis Khan country, right? That was the second verse of the third chapter. I found it. Chapter three is going to. No, but that's the Guru Prasad. Okay. Chapter three is craziness. What? Craziness. Shunya Padavi. So Shunya. Pranasya Shunya. Shunya. Shunya Padavi. Pranasya Shunya Padavi. Tada Rajapatthayate. Tada Chittam. Nilambaram. Tada Kalasya Alasya Vanchan. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's like Prana Sushunya Padavi. Yeah. Is that the name for Sushumna? I That's see. That's the name for The empty place or what? Pada Pada means a place or and Padavi. I'm not sure how you get that word, Padavi V. The road of emptiness? The empty road? Having the road. Having a place? The one that has the road. Or the one that has the place, because of has the word pada, pada vin. V is a, like paravan, you mean? Uh, as in like Same as van? Yeah, van vin. vin. A feminine, paravi. Shunya paravi. It's. Okay. Anyway, the empty. What? The empty road, empty path. Yeah, the empty path is the, is the royal path. It's the Raja Patayati. Yeah. It's the king road, the royal road. And then, then the chitta becomes nirambalam, Niram. which was without any support. And so mind is just mind in open, empty, emptiness, with no outside support or frame of reference, right. which is openness. Right. And this, this little thing he put in here with, his, with its objects of enjoyment is just some... Yeah, and banjanam doesn't mean evaded. Banjanam means deceived. And that is the deception of Kala, of time. Mm -hmm. right? The deception, you fool death, you trick death. Yeah, then you trick death. But you know what's way chittam malam neralambam? That means mind ceases to objectify. Yeah. So that doesn't mean that mind goes off, it withdraws. You see, he's taking it in a dualistic way, comes yeah. free of connections. Mm -hmm. But that means his mind has no object because mind encompasses all the objects. Yeah. That's a non-dual thing. So therefore, it is all of the connections. Yeah, right? the connections are still perceived. Yeah. But so it's not separate from it. It's not a subject-object connection. Alamba means the object of perception. So niralamba means it no longer objectifies. Yeah. And, the, and he, this guy who's translated, I'm sure, is reading this dualistically by saying... It becomes free from all connections. So that's like the yogi who's like, oh, I'm yeah. withdrawing into this inner space that I'm not going to touch anybody, I'm not going to have to wash dishes or listen to my wife. 
<laughs> and so actually, one becomes all the dishes and the thing. When Nir Alam I mean, there's no object because you, it's all, you're, you're all of it. And there's no problem washing. Exactly. They wash themselves. Yeah. <laughs> so that's one of the alternatives. I'm sorry, but I'm just fussing yeah, about the alternative. About this. Yeah, well, well, this is the other well, the, the translator here, obviously, yeah. you know, is, is Shunya you know that that, that Madhva. You know that that, that philosopher Madhva. Yeah. Madhva. He gets so worked up in the 15th century. The the the, the Dvaita Advaita. Yeah. The guy who was so upset by Shankara's non-duality that he came up with a brilliant, magnificent Indian concept of dualistic non-dualism, <laughs> which is so cool. Yeah. Right, and right. And so he says, Shunyavadas are those Buddhists. Yeah. And they're Nasticas, and they're nihilistic because they don't think the Vedas are divine, and they this and they that. And, and he gets all worked up about them. And they hate form. They hate yeah, they hate them, and, and they don't like us being with higher caste, which yeah. is their worst crime, etc. And so, and yet, in these working yogis of the same era, they're happy with Shunya, mm -hmm. and they call the Sushupta Shunya Padavi. Raja Patayata, Pranasya Raja Patayati. And these Nat yogis were also, the Nat cult was centered the, right? the Nat yogis. Yes. A lot of them were in Rajasthan, near Madhava. Oh, okay. You know, near that, where his. Where Madhava lived? Oh, yeah. see, he runs that area. I didn't know that. that area. I thought it was in the south. So I would say, oh, cool. Well, he just didn't get out of the house. No. Enough. Yeah, I thought that Madhva was a southerner too. But that was southern, but his the, uh, cult, you know. But um, not Madhva, Madhva. Madhvacharya. Yeah, Madhvacharya, we're talking about, right? Yeah. 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 He wrote, he wrote uh, the cult. whatever it is. Yeah, the, the encyclopedia. Yeah. 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 And he was a Dvaita Dvaita. Yeah, yeah. yeah his, his gesture was. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> Prosper? Meaning two. No, two. Oh, only two. Yeah, two. There's two there's things. the individual you, there's the jivatman. Really? And then there's the paramatman, and the two are eternally separate. So yes. they can, yeah. They can never yes. be one. And yeah. he had the idea, Blasphemous. he said that God, you could never be one with God. Yeah. And God was like a mother cat who would pick you up by the back of the neck mm -hmm. and put you in the heaven. To meow, I guess, forever. or suck on his tit forever or something. Yeah. <laughs> but you couldn't be him. Because no. that's right time, right time. Yeah. And Shankara is no good. He's a Prachanabhava. He was a crypto Buddhist. Yeah, forget him. So, Bob, <laughs> another fun thing in this verse is that in the Panchakrama, you have your Chitta Viveka, right? You have a mind isolation stage of the of in Nagarjuna's Panchakrama. Yeah. But all the uh, Chandra Kirti in uh, my text, my text, yeah, um, in the present in Pradipo Yodana refers to it alternatively as Chitta Lambana. Yeah. So he refers to that mm, a non objectification stage of the mind yeah. as being the he uses mind that objective, in, where mind, mind is objective. all of objectivity, that yeah. means. I think that's what that means. Yeah. Mind is all objects. Because, of, for example, if someone read the tantric thing of body isolation, speech isolation, and mind isolation dualistically, they would again think, oh, you're isolating from everything, you're re re removing from all connections. But what it actually means is that in, that, in those visualizations, uh, when the mandala triumphs <coughs> over the ordinary world, there's a thing called mandala raja agri, where the mandala vision is so powerful that it absorbs the whole universe world in the, for the meditator. And at that time, all, you know, Kundali and, and the different Buddhas, like every chameleon, like I was saying the other day, every chameleon, every like snake, every mosquito is a goddess. Mm -hmm. In the Kala Chakra, they elaborate that and is a deity. So that, in other words, it's isolated from anything ordinary by seeing all the ordinary things as extraordinary. Right, so even even your saliva is the goddess Mamaki, which is a Buddha, god, not really a Buddha, a Buddhist. Actually, I want, I'm coining a word called Buddhist. Uh, people won't like it, but tough luck. Buddhist. Then we have a Buddha, Buddhist. We have a god and a goddess. We have a Buddhist. 
<laughs> Symbological word. What do you think? Buddha. So it's a Buddha. So you, you know, when you, so that's, there's nothing ordinary. You have a snot coming out of your nose. It's actually kindness of Mamaki. It's a goddess. You know, you have like something in your ear. It's like another different kind. It's, it's lochana, etc. <laughs> and that's what the isolation means. In other words, the isolation is you're isolating from any perception of anything as ordinary because your mind has absorbed all of it within the mandala. So there's nothing ordinary. Everyone is extraordinary. It's a, there's a great thing about that for a teacher. I think I mentioned last year, but someone didn't hear where... The, it's a great thing for a teacher. It is that all other beings are Buddhas and Buddhists. So when you're a teacher and you have students, they are pretending to need you to teach them because they know that you're so dense that you'll only learn when you say it yourself. <laughs> and so they're saying, oh yes, what, what about till I say? And then you say it, and then when you say oh, then you understand it. And they actually already know it. <laughs> this is really good, babe, because they're already perfect Buddhas and Bhattasattvas and everybody else. There's nobody is ordinary. You see, nothing is ordinary. It's really good, that kind of practice. Yeah, and I think the teaching comes out better with, what? That, with that kind of respect for the student. Yeah, exactly. And ultimately, they're extremely intelligent and kind. Yes. And already enlightened. Yes. Sort of. Otherwise, you <laughs> Sort of, yeah. As the sort of. Hiroshi famously said, everything is perfect. Sort of. And there's always a little room for improvement. <laughs> <laughs>